Nellie Reifler's elect H. Moss State Judge is an unexpected illustration of the most difficult question mankind faces today, says our classmate Grace Dilger. Like, are people inherently good, and what qualifies as a vice in a, in a world ripe with cruelty? Here's the catch. The pupils enrolled in Reifler School of Morality aren't human at all, just the opposite. Her use of animal and toy characters rather than human ones gives her the wiggle room to explore human facets of life, grief, the powerlessness of life, loneliness and sex, and lays them bare to her readers. With a concise, sharp voice, Reifler's works are as honest and moving as they are unsettling, coupling non-traditional narrators and points of view with, a ver with very real issues of identity, sanity, and a world that does not follow a strict set of ethical guidelines. Because of this, Nettle Reifler is a master of defamiliarization. De sometimes people act like dolls, and sometimes dolls act like people. Though Reifler rarely uses human characters, the fantastical elements serve only to enhance the poignancy of her storytelling. Her wit and charm help the readers cope with the tension and foreboding that can sneak into his or her consciousness. She has a way of giving readers a complicated story by using less. We can see this most recently in her three-part essay, in which she analyzes the extreme and vulnerable parts of her life with concise, cutting prose. Reifler makes complex emotions accessible. Her fiction, as well as her nonfiction, shares with readers experiences that echo the process of overcoming grief and guilt. In her work, the reader gains an understanding not only of the characters, but of themselves. <laughs> Nellie Reifler is the author of a collection of short stories entitled See Through, as well as the novel Alexis H. Elect H. Mouse State Judge. Her stories have appeared in Mancini's, Bomb, Jubilat, Nerve.com, and Lucky Peach, among others, and anthologized in books such as Lost Tribe, Jewish Fiction from the Edge, and Found Magazine's Requiem for a Paper Bag. She's a recommendations editor at Post Road, and she teaches at Sarah Lawrence College. She was co-director of Writing's Forum from 2005 to 2013, and she will be the visiting writer at Western Michigan University in the spring of 2014. Please join us in welcoming Nellie Reifler. Thank you, Gina and Shelley and all of you. It's really, really great to be back with you in this room. I've been looking forward to this um, just so much. Uh, I'm going to start out reading a little bit of um, this, uh, this essay. Um, oh, and I should also say that was an incredible Um, uh, I'm going to read a little bit of this piece of memoir, Blue Spark, um, partly because I don't think I would have written it if Jack Nekmanovich <laughs> put away that book I'm talking about you. I know I'm not your teacher anymore. <laughs> uh, you wore an Elliot Smith t-shirt to our Kathy Park Con discussion group last year, and um, I had wanted to take a, a picture, <laughs> but I kind of chickened out, and the next week I said, I wish I'd taken a picture of you in that great Elliot Smith shirt, and we had a conversation, a few of us, outside this building, because um, of course Jack was like, why? And I said, well, I knew him in college, he was a good friend of mine, and then a bunch of you said, you knew Elliot Smith, why don't you talk about this? And someone said, that's the first thing you should tell people. <laughs> uh, and um, but I did start thinking after that. You know, I really don't. I really don't talk about that. I don't talk about um, the people I knew who died, or a lot of these really crazy experiences that I had within a short amount of time. And if you read my essay, now you know about them. But um, because I knew I was going to be seeing Jack, and because. Yesterday was the 10-year anniversary of Elliot Smith's death. Um, I thought I would read a little bit of this piece that talks about Elliot. Um, there are other things that I talk about in this essay, but I thought I'd mostly stick to Elliot. So this is from the third chapter. Is this OK? Mike's OK? OK. Um, this is chapter 16. Oh, I should also give you some background. I should really give you some background. Uh, it was in, in August of 2001, I got married. My stepmother's um, entire immediate family was in a gruesome car crash on the way to my wedding. Her sister um, was um, brain dead, brain dead. 
dead and then taken off life support and her father's, uh, I don't talk about this in the essay, her father's um, pelvis was crushed and still can't walk. Her, step, her own stepmother developed dementia after the accident and um, right after the funeral, uh, one of my very dear friends, who Gina knew too, was murdered. Um, shot in the head point blank in Oakland, and that was September 9th, 2001. Uh, on, I, then I got a, then I decided I need to go, needed to go west to mourn with um, the other friends of my murdered friend. And I got a ticket on United Flight 93 for September 11th, 2001, um, which I canceled at the very last minute when I got cheaper seats on JetBlue. And it was a little more convenient uh, for my friend coming up in Oakland than San Francisco. So one phone call um, kept me from getting on United Flight 93. Then I had a saga with the plane I was on, and this all rendered me a little messed up and obsessed with saying goodbye to people. So that brings me to the place that I'm going to read um, to you from, which is that I heard that Elliot was doing really badly. And I wanted to say goodbye to him just in case. I hoped that he wasn't going to die. But I had a feeling that he might. Um, so we're, we're in 2003. <coughs> a book was to be born. My collection of stories, See Through, was going to be published in September 2003. I had galleys. It was June, and Noah, that was my new husband, it was June, and Noah and I would soon be leaving for Europe to attend Dylan's wedding. In 1996, I had read a story at Cornelia Street Cafe and brought along a small pile of chapbooks that I was passively selling. Elliot was there, and he bought one. The title story, Slope, was narrated by a serial killer who gives an infirm old veteran a blowjob. The narrator describes the man's penis in detail. Later, the story would be published in a small literary journal with so many typos, it looked like it was written in some kind of Celtic dialect. <laughs> Elliot, Elliot um, had called me the next day and left me a message. Did I ever answer my phone? Saying he read the stories and the writing was great, but they were so depressing he almost couldn't take it. So now, I thought, in 2003, that he might like to see an entire book of my work. I felt shy for some reason. Nervous. I hadn't seen him in years, and it was hard to reconcile the Elliot of my memories with the mythical beast spoken of by my students. The day before his knitting factory show, I dropped a galley off. At, I dropped a galley off at Off Soho Suites, where he was staying. The next evening, I was more nervous. I was on a mission to say the things you regret not saying to someone when they die. But at the same time, I hoped that my mission was a fool's mission and that Elliot was fine, the rumors were exaggerations. In fact, I hoped that by carrying out my mission, I might, in some magical thinking way, prevent Elliot's death. It made sense to me at the time. 17. The show was a train wreck. Elliot was in a stupor, and the crowd of fans seemed somehow gladiatorial, as if they wanted to see someone die, and they practically were seeing someone dying. Elliot forgot words to his songs, stopped playing, mumbled, made dark, self-damning remarks. Every time he fucked up, the crowd tittered. When he called himself an idiot, they cheered. These fans, they seemed a different breed from the old shows in the 90s. The hipster handbook had come out earlier that year. These kids were kind of like frat boys in trucker hats and skinny jeans. They had been, what, maybe 10 years old when Roman Candle came out? How had this happened? I felt sick. Elliot brought a couple of young woman, women out to sing Juan and back up on a song or two. I thought of how wry he'd been when I interrupted the intervention. This Elliot was not that Elliot, and the humor he was displaying on stage felt like a kind of act. He fucked up the song with the girls, and they looked anxious, and someone in the audience hooted. I left the room, went down the hall past the bar, and out onto Leonard Street. It was a sweet, soft June evening. Smoking in bars had just been banned a few weeks earlier, and a few of the trucker-capped, skinny, jeans young people were discovering what everybody would soon know, that the ban was actually kind of nice for smokers. 
It was an opportunity to get out of the crowd, clear your head, and flirt. I smoked a cigarette, too, and considered leaving. I could get Noah, we could go home, and Elliot would never miss me. I looked at the boys posing against the wall with their bony backs. I listened to their panicky hormonal voices. I thought of Billy, that was my murdered friend, tapping out a beat on a drum pad. I hadn't had a chance to say goodbye to him. I thought of Manaz and our hug the morning of the accident and of holding her warm hand in the hospital. Had I used my ticket on Flight 93, how many people would have wished they could have said goodbye to me? Who would have regretted not telling me they cared for me? I went back inside. The set was almost over. I found Noah. We made our way to the green room door. A gigantic boxer blocked the way. He asked my name and I told him and he slid through the door. Moments later, he returned and informed me that I was not allowed to visit Elliot. I remember beginning to shake. Was it true that Elliot had decided to dump his old friends? Had I imagined all these years our good conversations? Then I reminded myself about the spectacle I had just witnessed. Elliot was not in his right mind, and apparently the rumors whispered by mopey white undergrads were true. These references, into, somehow I was getting news about um, Elliot's drug use from my Sarah Lawrence students. They'd be like, yeah, he's smoking crack in the studio. I had no idea how they knew these things. Uh, <laughs> then the door opened again, and a young woman was standing there. She was one of the singers who had been on stage with him. Pretty in an unremarkable way, wearing a t-shirt and jeans. She was smiling at me, reaching out her hand. She apologized. I'm so sorry, she said. I'm Jennifer, come in. I didn't realize you were that author. At first, I didn't know what she was talking about. And then, oh yes, I was an author, sort of, almost. But what did that matter? If I hadn't written a book, I wouldn't have been allowed to see Elliot. And she was a gatekeeper, deciding who could greet Elliot. This was worse than if he'd simply not wanted to see me himself. Right then, I didn't like her. She still refused to allow Noah entry. 18, conversation number three. But I did what I'd intended to do. It was my third time visiting Elliot in this room, and the other two times seemed layered over this one like scrims. Nobody else was in there this time, maybe one other bouncer, I can't be sure, but no friends, old or new, just Jennifer, Elliot, and me. In Autumn DeWild's book of photos and interviews, Elliot Smith, a couple of people mentioned the hugs that Elliot gave. They were something to experience, it is true, totally enveloping, and if you were five feet tall, a kind of carnival ride that lifted you off the ground. The hug I got in the green room reassured me that I had done the right thing. We sat down on that lumpy, low couch, and he took my hand. I complimented him on the show, and he brushed it off, of course. He was partly the same Elliot I had seen on stage, that is, not Elliot, and partly the same as he'd ever been. Mostly, he wanted to talk about my book. He had read a few stories before the show, and he still found them a bit too dark, but was overflowing in an almost embarrassing way with compliments. He said he'd always wondered which one of his old friends would wind up becoming a successful artist. Painfully aware of the fact that my little book was a young writer's uneven first collection that had been midwifed by a very patient editor, I tried to explain that I really was not a success. Look at you, I said, you're Elliot Smith. He shrugged and said that didn't count. In a sort of mumbling, rambling way, he explained. He could never write a book, he said, because he wouldn't be able to commit to that kind of unmediated transfer of his words to the audience. It was too intimate for him. The idea of one person sitting quietly and reading his words on a page. He said that he needed music and an audience that he could respond to who responded to him, whose personality he could sense, who encouraged him and was, who was rooting for him, and who wants you to fucking die, I wanted to say. He went on, he got emotional. He did it all for them, he said. His fans were all he had left. His fans understood him. They were all that was keeping him going. Everybody else pretty much sucked. Everybody else had betrayed him. Old friends had turned against him. Reader, I saw doom. I tried to move the conversation to specific old friends, people who cared about him, some who knew him better than I did, who wanted the best for him. 
I said that Alexander was doing well. Elliot snarled. He's married now, right? He said, rolling his eyes. Yes, I said, and Christine's great. Elliot was unmoved. I tried filling him in on Dylan's life and Astrid's. He lit up a little at the mention of Astrid's name, but then collapsed again. I asked if he heard about Billy, that Billy had been murdered. Billy and Elliot, um, along with my old boyfriend, had started the band Heat Miser together back in college, so they had played together. Uh, I asked if he heard about Billy, that Billy had been murdered. Yeah, he trailed off, he clearly didn't care. He was getting nervous, he wanted or needed something. His eyes darted to Jennifer, she was getting nervous too. Elliot, I said, I came here to tell you I love you and I am glad you are alive. He stopped jittering for a moment. He looked surprised, abashed. I love you too, he said. He gave me another hug. And I left, saying goodbye so quietly they couldn't hear me. 19. This is from an article called All Things Must Pass by Jonathan Valenia in Magnet Magazine. Something terrible happened on the night of October 21st, 2003 in the cozy box-like bungalow at 1857 and a half Lemoyne Street in the Echo Park section of Los Angeles where Elliot Smith lived with girlfriend Jennifer <coughs> Chiba. In Chiba's version of events, the couple had an argument that grew so heated she locked herself in the bathroom. At some point, she heard Smith scream and unlocked the door to see him standing with his back to her. When he turned around, there was a knife sticking out of his chest and he was gasping for breath. Panicked, Chiba pulled the knife out of him and Smith turned and took a few set steps before collapsing. Chiba called 911 and an operator talked her through CPR until the paramedics arrived. Smith was rushed to a nearby hospital where emergency surgery to repair the two stab wounds to the heart couldn't save his life. And now, now I'll read something from the front. Mountains beyond. The sun was setting behind the mountains. 
Here in the southern hills, it was always warm and dry, and that was nice, but every so often she wished to know what it was like in the cool valley or up on the foggy mountains. Lazily, she directed her gaze back across the deck. Ken, his foot still inside Barbie's head, removed his own head and passed it to Barbie. Barbie gripped it and rubbed the brown hair across, across her chest bumps in circular motions. Now, Ken's mouth spoke. Come on, baby, give it to me now. Barbie lifted Ken's head and lowered it, teasingly slow, onto her own neck ball. She rolled his head around on the pink orb that topped her long, slender neck. Ken withdrew his foot and put Barbie's head on his neck ball. Then they slammed their bodies together once again. Ah, 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 said Ken. Ah, 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 said Barbie. The wave-like motions were starting to get to Skipper. She stood up and made her way delicately across the deck, down the gleaming white stone walkway to the threshold of the pink townhouse. Her pink twirling baton was leaning against the door. She picked it up and twirled it a couple of times. Inside, she rode the elevator to her room on the second floor. Thank you. Yes. Who's your favorite speaker at Writers Forum? My favorite speaker? You have to remember, I was here since 2005. That's a lot of people. I was here for a year before Gina started. It's funny, I can only rem I can remember all the really disastrous <laughs> ones. <laughs> um, but we had so many really great ones. So many really great ones. Um, it's really hard to pick one. I mean, we really had so many good ones. I'm going to think about it. If I think of, I, I probably, for diplomatic reasons, should pick like two or three, but I'll, you know, I'll keep. Um, you know who was. It, Okay, one just came into mind, Cindy <coughs> Anderson. That day, how many of you were, any of you here when Cindy was here? And that was a really, really, um, that was a great day. That was a really great day in the forum. She was great. And there were other people who were incredible oh, readers. Hmm? Yeah, her movie's out now. And it's been in all these festivals, it's been great, yeah. The punk singer, Cindy Anderson. Yeah. Um, one thing about your writing that really strikes me uh, is that you manage to take a really detached stance, which I think adds a lot of value, like particularly in the Elliot Smith thing. Obviously, that was something very dear to you. But how do you do that when you're writing about something so charged? Um, thinking specifically about that that essay. Um, I had never written memoir before, and I don't, I, it was really hard to figure out how to write it, and honestly, to, to be completely truthful, I was like, physically sick the entire time I was writing those 40 pages, and I had a lot of false starts, um, and I'm trying to remember, like, how I, I, you know what, I think that, um, I'm not sure I can talk about the tone so much, but I, it's written for, if, if you haven't read it, it's written in these tiny, tiny little chapters, like really short. And something about numbering, something about not having to think about this big narrative and thinking of it as instead just in terms of scenes that I describe, the way I do as a fiction writer, um, that helped me. Like, um, just separating it into scenes rather than feeling so overwhelmed because there's so much that isn't in the essay. For instance, the injuries that I was talking about to the other people in my stepmother's family. Um, once I uh, started just writing these numbered scenes, and they also have headings, each, each numbered, little tiny numbered chapter has a bold heading that's like the title of the chapter. And something about giving myself that form made me able to step away and, and talk about the scenes. Addressing the reader, um, I, I, like I said, I, I never ever written anything. I'd only written really like two pieces of nonfiction about anything, like about books, anything. I, I've always been allergic to writing nonfiction, and so I saw I saw Jack. I had that conversation, and I started thinking, 
why don't I talk about it? I should kind of figure out how to write about this stuff. And then the weaklings, um, which is the online. And I knew, the other thing was that I knew that I would never, ever write about Elliot, at least, or any publication um, where I was where I was going to get paid much, where there were going to be ads, where anyone was going to make a profit, and where I wouldn't have total control over how I wanted to talk about it. So, um, and so much has been, I mean, so much has been written about him already. There's so much crap, and there's a new memoir, I mean, a new biography out of him that I think is actually going to be quite good. It just came out, and um, the author, William Todd Schultz, uh, he had many, we had many long phone conversations while I was writing this piece. I'm digressing, but if you want to read a real biography of Elliot Smith, I would say get his book that just came out, which is called um, Something Angel. Uh, Todd Schultz. Um, now I've, I've digressed from the question. Addressing the reader. So the Weekly sent out a manifesto. They're an online essay magazine and they sent out their manifesto about um, how they work. And I loved their manifesto, and they sent it to me with a little invitation anytime I wanted to write something, and I wrote to the editor there, Jennifer Cabot, and said, you know, I do have this little piece, this little piece of something I might want to write. And she, um, she, she forced me to do it. She came over to my house, she spent the day with me and my kid, she talked about how I would do it, and I was so stuck. She said, you know what, just write it as an email to me. Just say, dear Jennifer, and just tell the story. And, it ended, and that ended up becoming the dear reader. So it felt intimate for me. I felt like I was writing to Jennifer. Um, anything else? I feel like Hannah. <laughs> but I'd be really happy to answer another question. Yeah. Uh, how hard was it to get a book published in the Um, <laughs> It wasn't as hard as I expected. <laughs> like, I thought no one was going to want to book the doll talk, the back of the doll talking especially. I mean, really, I, uh, I just got an email from one of my father's friends about the book, and sometimes I forget it's actually out there in the world, and people, are, people know that that's. I imagine that's <laughs> um, weirdly, to my total shock, it was originally part of a collection. It was going to be a collection and a novella. And to my absolute shock, um, many publishers were interested in it. Um, however, at, there, there were many editors, I should say, many, many editors. And the, um, the intelligent people in marketing and many of these houses were kind of like, wait, you're saying you want to publish a collection of stories, and this is the main part of it? No. But luckily, that didn't happen to me at Faber, which is part of FSG. Um, so it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be so hard. Um, I had an agent years ago. I wrote it in 2008, and my, my agent then, she read it. She hated it so much, she literally I'm not joking, wouldn't talk to me about it. Wouldn't <laughs> refuse. <laughs> hated it so much, viscerally hated it. And was so disappointed in me for going in that direction. <laughs> so go ahead and write your books about Don. I mean, what I learned from writing, from getting H. Mouse published, is you should write what you want to write and what is most fun and what is kind to you. It does, the rule isn't that that means it's going to get published, but it doesn't mean it's not going to get published. And if you write something thinking about publishing, that's definitely not a guarantee that it's going to get published. And we all start writing for the pleasure and the, the surprise. And um, so I say go ahead and write your doll fucking or whatever fucking, really. Just go ahead and do those, those fucking scenes. It's OK. <laughs> What is it like that this may have been, maybe you experienced this before, I don't know, but to know that there are critics out there or literary professionals out there who do viscerally hate what you've written? I never experienced it 
before this book. With, with See Through, my collection, um, I, like, I, I had a couple people thought it was very dark, you know, that it was depressing. I didn't understand why someone would read a depressing book. Um, but I never had experienced the kind of visceral hatred or just total bewilderment. Like, all, all the reviews that have come out of H. Mouse have been good, except the Publishers Weekly review. It was, the, the writer was just bewildered. I, they just did not know what to make of it. They had no idea how to relate to it. It wasn't even a terrible review. It was just kind of like, I don't even know what I just read. There were dolls, there were fucking, there was an abduction, there were uh, there was a cult. I don't know. <laughs> that, so it's weird. If you're someone who likes to be liked and likes to please people, <laughs> well, then it's called sublimation, right? Like in normal life, like with people, human, you know, regular people, I want everyone to like me and I want to be polite and please people. And then, and then I will write a book with, you know, brutal doll fucking in it. And then, and then that's, I guess, how I, how I get out my.